Okay, we're going to talk about the uh, monthly space news, which once again is things that have happened related to space uh, since the last meeting we had, which was about a month ago on October 8th. So uh, highlights of what's coming up in these news, uh, we'll update a little bit on the DART asteroid crash and you know, how we're going to defend against uh, asteroids, how that turned out. MOXIE, the oxygen generation on Mars, which is an ongoing experiment aboard the Perseverance rover. There was a nice paper updating where they stand on that. The Chinese space station is completed. There is a technology demo on using inflatable heat shields for returning from space, which is more useful than it may sound at first. Also, just a little bit on an upcoming moon launch, not Artemis, but actually a different one, a robotic probe. We'll talk a little bit about that and recent launches to space. So first of all, back to the planetary defense thing. We crashed into an asteroid, everybody knows that, but what was the final result? In case anybody had missed this, the DART spacecraft crashed into the smaller of a binary asteroid pair. I put in the actual images, incidentally, instead of the original artist's conception, because that's what they really look like. The small one is more detailed because we crashed into that one, so we have a more close-up picture. The effects have been recorded by a lot of different organizations. The Hubble Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope all looked at it. And there are several dimensions to this. The first part is, what was the orbit of the smaller asteroid after the crash around the larger one? And that is measured just by looking for, if you can see a dim spot in the sky, which represents that pair, you can't actually distinguish between the two, but you see the light and when it gets dim, that tells you that, okay, the, the smaller asteroid passed in front of the bigger one and you count, you see how long that takes. And so that's one way they looked at it. And we'll talk about some other things they're doing. It turned out the effectiveness of this experiment was more than we had expected. The orbit of the smaller asteroid is about 12 hours around the large one, a little bit less than that. And it reduced it by 32 minutes, which is kind of noticeable. Why? Probably because the asteroid itself is in a category called pile of rubble. It's mostly a bunch of boulders just kind of held together by gravity. You smash into them, you knock a lot of them out of the way. So you imagine if you have an asteroid coming this way and you're, you're trying to slow it down, you hit it, a whole bunch of rocks get thrown out into space based on conservation of momentum, that actually kind of gives you a little extra kick. And that's pretty much what they figured happened. That turned out a lot better than expected. As long as all those particles don't spread out symmetrically, you know, you definitely get an effect in one direction or another. Now, the second question though is, okay, that's all well and good, but um, what about the overall combination of the two asteroids? You know, people might think, oh, well, you're hitting the little one, there's no connection with the big one, but there is, they're held together by gravity. It's just like being held by a string, really. Um, they affect each other. So the question is, for that overall pair, did it affect the orbit? And that's gonna take a lot longer to tell. I mean, the orbits are, are pretty slow. So that'll go on for actually over the next couple of years. How did they even tell that? Well, as another one of these kind of things we talked about, instead of dimming of the light coming directly from it, what we'd watch instead is we watch for the path of the asteroid to cross in between us and some other star. And all those star positions are well known. And so when it gets dimmed, right about the time when you might expect that you know the asteroid is going by, you can pinpoint the time, and you do that a couple of times, and you get a pretty good idea of how the orbit is going. So the European Space Agency, ESA, they've put together a crowdfunding kind of approach where they just want lots of, even amateur astronomers to uh, contribute to this. And so they're doing that, and they hope to come up with better answers on how much the overall orbit was affected. So one interesting thing is, what does it look like right now after the crash? That's this picture here of the blue kind of thing. And if you look at it really closely, there's actually two kind of comet tails coming up. They're, they're both about three o'clock here, just above that, but there's actually two of them. They haven't actually really figured out why. The second one appeared later than the first one. And so it's a little bit of a mystery, but uh, that's what you know, science is all about. You go out and you blow up stuff and you see what happens and you try to explain it. That, that's science in a nutshell. So they will explain that, but they haven't yet. I mean, incidentally, then there's just a, a little picture over here in the lower right of you know, imagining what it looks like when an asteroid crosses in front of a star. It's kind of hard to see the little star there, but it's, it's working in the background. Okay, next topic, a little different one on another ongoing project. This is on the Perseverance rover, the one that's running on Mars right now. There is a project to generate oxygen as a test, and it's purely a technology demonstration. This is not the, you know, the actual thing they'll use in the future. That's a long acronym like everything else at NASA. What it does is it generates O2 by extracting it from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The atmosphere of Mars is 95% CO2, so there's plenty of CO2 there. It's a very low pressure. You know, it's only 1% of the density of, of the Earth and pressure of, of the Earth's atmosphere, but it's there. And so they figure, well, why not try to get that? 
there aren't that many times when you can actually land something on Mars, so they stuck it on Perseverance. It didn't really need to have a rover. It was more just a case of there aren't many opportunities. The equipment was ready, put it on there. So they did. I'm sure you've seen lots of pictures of the Perseverance rover. It's in, highlighted here in yellow in this little picture and just where that is gives you an idea. It's a small part of the overall Perseverance rover. Now the test was trying to take carbon dioxide and just split it up into carbon monoxide and oxygen. And then in the real system, you'd have to collect that oxygen, maybe liquefy it and store it in a tank or something. They're not doing that part of it. They're just checking out, can they make the reaction work in the conditions of Mars? They're just venting it back out to the Martian atmosphere now. The most they expected to get was about 10 grams per hour of oxygen when they're running uh, the reactor, which, by the way, is about the equivalent of a medium-sized tree. This box that you're seeing in yellow here weighs about 38 pounds. When it's running, it uses 300 watts of power. Now, that is interesting because the maximum power that was ever available at any one time on the Perseverance rover is only about 110 watts. It really runs about 100, basically a nuclear power source that's on that due to natural decay using the heat of that. So what that says is they pretty much have to stop everything when they run this experiment and they run off the battery for a while and then they run the battery down while they're doing the test. So they don't do that all the time. This is something they only do occasionally. They've done it seven times. This is really an important experiment. It is the first time on another planet we've actually tried to use the resources available at that planet or moon or anything else. In situ resource utilization, ISRU is an acronym, much easier to say. So why do they want to do this? Well, it's really long-term sustainability. It costs so much to move a pound of water or oxygen or anything to Mars because it's so far away. You want to live off the land, and that's really what ISRU is all about. A couple of main obvious applications. One is you want to breathe. So, of course, you get oxygen, you need that to breathe. The other thing, though, is fuel, in particular, fuel for return trips. And by fuel, I mean really propellant. You know, there's two parts to that. You know, your typical, you have something like methane and oxygen. You put them together, you burn them in a rocket engine. It turns out the oxygen is most of the weight of that propellant. So even just generating all that locally makes a big difference in your ability to take back off. A common question that then comes up, well, why not go for the water in the form of ice? You know you need that long term. I mean, obviously you need it for drinking water, but actually you also need it as a source of hydrogen atoms. So for instance, if you want to make methane to make the other part of the propellant, you need the hydrogen atoms. Methane is, is four atoms of hydrogen combined with one of carbon. So you need the hydrogen atoms, but you don't get that out of carbon dioxide. So you electrolyze the water, you could do that. But the problem with that on a first trip is that you'd have to be mining the ice. You have to find the ice, first of all. You have to mine it, which might involve going under the surface. You've got to melt it. You've got to purify it, because there's probably all kinds of salts in there, and that's, that's not a trivial problem. You've got to transport it back to wherever uh, it is that you're, you're doing the actual reaction. So you do want that long term. It's really essentially a necessity for settling in space. But short term, you want something you can just kind of drop in place. You, know, you drop it down there, you turn it on, you let it run, and that could be automated. And that's something you can do before you send the actual astronauts there. That's the big reason why they looked into this kind of technology. The raw materials are just there. All you need is a source of energy. I would say all you need. Of course, that means you need a nuclear reactor um, to provide you the power. But you need that anyway. It's just hard to have enough solar cells on Mars between the reduced sunlight that's available out there uh, and all the dust and everything, you're gonna have to have nuclear power. So the reason I'm doing this now is that a paper was published fairly recently about how that's been going. And what they concluded was they can reliably generate about six grams an hour of the oxygen. They did it at seven various different conditions, day and night and different seasons. And that's actually important because on Mars, the atmospheric pressure and density varies quite a bit, but it's really a factor of two. You go from the cold winter, well over 100 below zero out there, as opposed to a sunny day on the equator when maybe it's 60 or something. There's huge variations in temperature, in particular in, in the pressure. And as I said, it's really a factor of two. And there's even seasonal variations because the CO2 in the poles, well, there must be more on one side than the other because CO2 evaporates when it's warm and then it condenses back at the poles when it's, when it's cold. So there's a lot of variation anyway in the atmosphere. That's why, for instance, they had to ground the Mars helicopter for a while, the one that came with the Perseverance rover. Remember, there was a period there where they really couldn't fly it because there wasn't enough density in the air for that propeller to do any good. So it's a noticeable impact. It's just a simple chemical reaction, but of course, like most things, that doesn't mean that it scales up to something you can actually use. There's problems. For instance, this particular process, it uses a, essentially a catalyst, and you can get coking, which is depositing carbon. So you want to take the carbon dioxide or convert it to carbon monoxide and oxygen. But if you're not careful, it'll go all the way to carbon and cover up the metal electrode and it wouldn't work anymore. 
there's other problems with the catalyst itself oxidizing. So they have various ways of avoiding it, but they had to try it all out under actual Martian conditions, and that's what they did. More details on what this equipment looked like. It starts off, you got the Martian air, it comes into an ordinary filter, a HEPA filter like you might put on your furnace. Obviously, that's not what they'd have to use long term. But short term, they're only running this thing for you know, a total of 15, 16 hours or something. So they figure that's okay. They can get by with that. Long term, you'd have to go to some kind of electrostatic dust filter or something else that you could actually clean and get the dust out of there. So anyway, the air is filtered to get the dust out. There's a compressor, and it increases the pressure to about 100 times. There's a picture there. The compressor type is called a scroll compressor. Not that different than what you might have in your air conditioner at home. It's also pretty commonly used in vacuum pumps in particular. So the other thing is this reaction, it occurs at a high temperature, 800 degrees centigrade, about 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. So it has to heat that up. And then you apply the voltage and there's basically a nickel based catalyst that's involved in this. And then it decomposes the carbon dioxide into oxygen and CO. And then you get ions of oxygen out of that. It then passes through a ceramic filter that only passes the oxygen and then recombines and it makes the O2. And they get pretty pure results, 99.6%. And NASA had said that they need that kind of purity, both for breathing and even for fuel use. So they actually met the, the criteria that they needed right there. So they've run it, as I said, about seven times so far. But each test takes a while. Because it's running cold most of the time, they have to heat the thing up to 800 degrees centigrade. So it takes a couple hours to get it up to temperature, get it stabilized. Then they can run it for about an hour. And as I said, they have to shut everything else down while they're doing that because they don't really have all the power needed except to ring off the battery. So they've shown that this will work on a small scale. Will it scale up? That's the biggest question on all these kind of things. Technology demo is one thing. It's like a pilot plant. You know, virtually any kind of chemical plant it starts off in a test tube and then it maybe migrates to being something in a refrigerator sized pilot plant and then on to, to bigger things. Boxy generates six grams an hour of oxygen. Even one astronaut needs about 35 grams an hour. So that's not enough for one astronaut right there. What are the factors needed in scaling up? If you look at it in terms of total production, if you're there for 18 months for several humans, you need a couple of tons of oxygen produced one way or another. And especially if you want to store some up ahead of time, you know, you want to think about how much can you prepare ahead of time, even before the astronauts get there. Now, then there's the fuel question. If you're using this for fuel to get back off the surface of Mars, back up to orbit, that's assuming a craft is probably about 50 tons. They've calculated that a, a typical example, if you're using methane and oxygen, for instance, you need 31 tons of oxygen for that uh, and nine tons of methane. So even if you haven't made the methane with this particular process, at least you've made the 31 tons of the oxygen. That amount of production would take two to three kilograms an hour for 20 to 26 months. So that's one of the hidden assumptions behind all this is that you will send something there ahead of time. It will just be plopped down and start running and, and start making this. As we've actually pointed out, none of this is really in the plans for the actual landings by the organizations doing the human landings. They don't assume that'll work. But at least other parts of NASA are, in fact, working on it so that, you know, at some point it probably will get used. So what they call it is the big moxie, meaning the full scale uh, apparatus that needs a power plant, 25 to 30 kilowatts, which actually isn't that different than what you need to, to run a good sized house in, in Houston in the summer. I actually asked the question of one of the guys there who is involved in ISRU. I asked him flat out, will this thing scale up? And what he said was, well, directly that thing, no. But there is various, various modifications that they know about already that they believe fully will work. And NASA has ongoing contracts. They have three separate contracts with this company called Oxion that right now is the one that's providing this, uh, this solid oxide catalyst. So it actually looks kind of promising. Okay, moving on to a separate topic, Chinese space station. Phase one is complete. And they did that just October 31st. They added a third module. It's essentially the same as the second module. The only bad thing about it is that, um, just like they did on all their others, their heavy lift rocket, the boosters fall off to the side, but the, the second stage is really what's left in the first stage. That thing goes up into orbit and it takes longer to fall out. And when it falls out, it's totally uncontrolled. They make no attempt to, to do anything with that. So people got worried that probably overreacted. They shut down a bunch of airports in Europe, but actually the thing fell into the Pacific Ocean. It didn't really cause any problems. Uh, the Chinese are basically just gambling on probability that the odds are, probably not going to hit anybody. And there have been a lot of complaints about that. Though. They, eventually, they'll have to address that. So anyway, phase one is complete. Now, they've always said they can expand it, but this is the basic space station, as shown in this picture right here. The three main modules is kind of a T uh, formation. And this is shown here with uh, a docking uh, 
spacecraft for cargo and also one for the crew. So the pressurized volume is about uh, 11,000 cubic feet, capacity of six people. They have three there now. Um, they wouldn't have been able to support more than three with, without this thing. The mass is about a fifth that of the International Space Station right now. It runs about 238 miles up uh, low Earth orbit. Um, it does have five robotic arms, and they've made a point of advertising how theirs are much more precise than the one. Of course, the Canadian arm is one of the big ones on the space station, and that was put up there years and years ago. So it's not surprising technology has improved, and they've taken advantage of that. Probably the most interesting thing that will be coming in the near future, within the next couple of years, is they're going to put up a Hubble-class telescope um, and put it right next to it. That way, if there's any problems, they can do, they can actually dock it. You know, they they can send astronauts over. They can, in fact, just dock it and fix you know do whatever they need to do. You know, we don't have a space shuttle to send people up and, and do that kind of stuff anymore. So, what that actually does, it sounds quite sensible. I have to have to give you credit for that. Okay, another thing that's happened recently is inflatable heat shields. Why might you want such a thing? Well, right now the typical heat shield is something that's in the nose cone of the rocket, you know, the fairing. And so when that falls off and you want to go back, um, you're coming back from, from Mars or just from a higher, higher Earth orbit, you know, you have a, a heat shield that just opens up and it gets hot and it absorbs a lot of the energy and it slows you down. You need that to basically get down to the point where you can deploy a parachute and then drop down to the ocean. This is especially going to be important for Mars. With Mars, the atmosphere is so thin, you really need a really big heat shield and you just can't. You know, you can't get one big enough. You know, the fairing is only, you know, five meters maybe at most. Uh, you just can't do anything with it. And that's actually been considered one of the main limitations of, of landing on Mars, um, other than just expending a lot of fuel. But who, who's interested in this? It's not just for Mars. Um, actually, part of this research it was done by NASA, but it was also funded in part by United Launch Alliance because they want to use this with their Vulcan rocket. They're not doing the boosters that land on their own. But they, what they want to do is at least recover the engines. And so they need a way to get those engines back down safely. But there's other longer term benefits for these kind of heat shields. Uh, you get more mass back, maybe from the space station. You need an easy way. If you have something you want to send back, well, an inflatable heat shield should be pretty cheap. It won't cost you so much. And that'll especially be important if you want to have any kind of in-space manufacturing, whether it's on the space station or anywhere on the moon or anywhere else. If you want to bring it back to Earth, this is actually going to be a way that should reduce those costs quite a bit. So it went up as a secondary payload. There's a weather satellite being launched uh, back on November 10th, and it went up. It was deployed and detached and tested, and it worked. This thing, the diameter is six meters. It looks like this, uh, at the top picture there, it looks like that when it's inflated. It was six meters, you know, like 19 feet. And the fairing that it came from was only four meters. So at least they're demonstrating that they can take something that's bigger than the nose cone, you know, and, and expand it and use it. And now it started off attached to a, a centaur, the upper stage of the Atlas rocket that it went up on. And you can see it the, down in the far front. Um, you can see the, um, you can see this, it's called loft ID. They didn't actually bring the entire second stage, the centaur second stage down. They, re, they then detached and they just brought down the heat shield itself. So uh, in that sense, it wasn't a complete test, but they're still basically validated. This kind of thing is going to work. And they had all kinds of instrumentation. They communicated back to the, the, the spacecraft above them. They, they ejected a small recorder right before they landed. And anyway, they have all kinds of data on this now, but it appeared to work. It gets to about 1400 degrees centigrade. I've seen several different conflicting so numbers. Testing. Yeah, yeah, this was back on, yes, back on November 10th. Yeah, so they slowed down. Deceleration, it's up to about 9G. So I mean, it has a pretty substantial effect. That atmosphere really works. It gets it down to about Mach 0.7. You know, one way to think about this is you're starting off at a you're very high supersonic velocity and you're deploying a bunch of fabric. You know, nonetheless, it manages to hold together and do its job. Then there's a parachute to drop down to the earth and then we've recovered it already. Now, the real applications of this will have to be bigger. For the Vulcan rocket, just for that engine, they figure 12 to 14 meters, so it's going to be substantial. And for a Mars lander, it has to be even bigger, uh, probably 16 meters. Yeah. Yeah, they had a nice animation there. They actually had the picture of the actual thing happening too. Um, I don't actually know what it is. I'm, I'm assuming it's you know somewhat like a Kevlar kind of a thing, but I you know I, I didn't see any details on exactly what that is. Okay, now there's a launch coming up to the moon, not Artemis, another one here. Um, it actually has several payloads on board. One is the, uh, the iSpace Lander, it's a Japanese company. 
And this is really purely a, a commercial venture. Now they have some contracts with the government on things they're doing, but that lander, I'm not gonna talk much about that. That actually has a, a UAE um, rover inside of it, as well as some other things. But the one I'm gonna talk about in this talk is the uh, lunar flashlight, which is a very small, it's just a six unit sized CubeSat. Um, there's pictures of all these things. Uh, the lunar flashlight is on the, the table in that workbench up there. This is, you know, people always think of the, the pictures of what it looks like in space or those kind of things, or what, is, you know, what the flashy rocket launch looks like. At some point, there's a, a back room where there's a bunch of testing going on and it looks more like this. So yeah, there it is sitting on a bench. Uh, you know, they're, they're doing various tests with it. The lander itself is on the, the lower left corner of the picture here. That's a little bit bigger and more substantial. And then again, that's gonna contain a rover which rolls off of it and various other things. The rover is here in the center. That's the one from United Arab Emirates that they're working on. So just thought I'd give you some pictures on what this stuff looks like. Um, this is what it looks like in space. No much, much prettier, isn't it? There, well, they have some kind of a thing that's going to expand like a, you know, a transformer uh, <laughs> in the cartoons. <laughs> they, they've kind of nicknamed it that because they're, they're good at that. They, they have some other ones that they say are like origami. So, you know, they're big on things that unfold and, you know, do a lot of interesting things from a very small initial package. That's what they're, they're doing that as a specialty. So lunar flashlight, this is what it looks like much prettier up here than it was on the bench. Think of it as a briefcase size. It's going to look for the permanently dark craters at the lunar south pole in particular, shine some infrared laser beams into them, see how much gets reflected back, and that's how they're going to tell whether there's ice there or not. Because they, you pick the right frequency of infrared, it, it's very sensitive to water um, in the form of ice. So you get a reflection back, you're just looking at rock. You don't get a reflection, um, then, it's, then it's, it's ice. So this is another one of these near rectilinear halo orbits again, a very eccentric orbit. It goes out to 42,000 miles and it comes within nine miles of the lunar south pole. And that's why they wanted something that's a pretty stable orbit so they can go over it many, many times. And that turns out that's one that you can do w without having to maintain, you know, use much fuel to maintain that orbit. NRO. NRO. Yeah. Yeah. They say near rectilinear, they would say a halo orbit. But yeah. Yeah, gateway, it's very much like the capstone one, which is going before it, which, which is there to test out the same kind of orbit for, for the gateway. Yes. Well, this, this one's coming close to the South Pole, which means it's going to have very little time, but it's just very close. So luckily, lasers, the light travels are very fast. So it doesn't take long to get that measurement. So yeah, that all worked out. The, um, yeah, the other one, the capstone, that's the other way. That one, that's in close uh, to the North Pole, actually. Maybe not quite that close. Now, this is another, also another one of those launches where it takes about three months to actually get there. It's some kind of a minimum, minimum orbit that doesn't, uh, doesn't, you don't get there fast. But that way they could just launch on a standard Falcon 9 rocket. So. Now, there's one other interesting thing about this particular uh, spacecraft. It has a, mon a, a new monopropellant. A uh, monopropellant is something like well, hydrazine. And hydrazine is kind of the typical one you think of. Basically, you shoot it and you have it hit a catalyst and it instantly reacts and, and generates the, the thrust that you need. So it's been kind of popular for many, many years, but it's extremely toxic. So nobody wants to handle it. I mean, you have to wear hazmat suits to deal with it. You know, if it ever escapes, you know, during this, some kind of accident, you got a problem. Also, it doesn't need a heater. So anyway, this new, this new thing is basically meant to replace um, the hydrazine, and it looks like it's probably going to be fairly effective, they hope. They've used it once before. You know, it hasn't been used very much. The Air Force Research Lab is the one that developed this. Okay, so moving on, um, just a few miscellaneous items. Blue Origin finally delivered their big engines for the Vulcan rocket. Um, it's been a long time coming, so everybody's breathing a sigh of relief on that, or at least ULA certainly is. Um, uh, the other interesting minor note is that uh, China, of course, has a million different kinds of launchers. Um, most of them start with Long March, um, or that's English translation anyway. But the one that was a big one that was coming along was kind of the SLS equivalent. It's called the Long March 9. It was a heavy lift rocket to be used for moon missions and that sort of thing. Originally, it was pretty much kind of copying the SLS. In particular, meaning it was expendable, completely expendable, and had side-mounted uh, boosters and about the same kind of size. Um, they've now said they're not doing that anymore. They um, they are going to a, at least a reusable first stage, and that's changing the design. They won't have the side boosters anymore. Um, they'll have something that lands. Now it turns out, in process of doing this, they were also building the, the probably the most powerful engine that anyone's ever built, is a million pounds of thrust. Um, they've tested it, you know, and it was looking good. But now they're realizing, well, okay, maybe with the new regime, with uh, 
you know, landing an empty booster, you don't need that much thrust. And restarting that with such a small, you know, like on a small scale might not work that well. They're probably going to end up going back to smaller engines, more like you have in the Falcon 9 or in Starship, where you only need you know one or two of those things firing to land the booster, because after all, the booster is empty at that point. It's not trying to accelerate up. It doesn't have other loads. So it's a very different uh, load profile. They're probably going to go to you know, a lot of engines. So that was kind of interesting. OK, so now we're at that point where people can guess how many launches have we had since the last meeting. Uh, OK, that's a good guess. <laughs> and I should comment that, um, of course, October 8th was slightly more than a month, so we have room for a little bit more there. You're low. You're way low, actually. You're way low, yeah. <laughs> well, OK, well, I'll give you another clue. OK, if you count just the last couple of days, there were three just in the last couple of days, including this morning, where there, were, there was a Falcon 9 that launched, which I managed to squeeze that into the count. Incidentally, a picture before we actually give you the answer then, I'll just mention that the Falcon Heavy actually has flown for the first time in three years. A lot of that has been, I mean, maybe there isn't that much demand for that particular weight class. Part of it's because the Falcon 9 itself has gotten more capable. Um, and part of it's just an awful lot of the payloads were just not ready. I mean, a lot of them were these, uh, you know, National Reconnaissance Office and monster satellites that they kept reworking and reworking. And, you know, a lot of those are years and years behind. It isn't actually completely the market's fault. There. Um, but anyway, it was more than three years. It is currently the world's most powerful rocket. Now, if SLS launches next, that'll be the most uh, powerful operational rocket. And then when Starship comes, this is the Falcon Heavy, actually. So this one has the, the two side boosters on this one are essentially the same as the Falcon 9s. Yeah, operational is the key word. It actually does work. Okay. All right, so the answer, I, by the way, is uh, 27. We've had 26. 27. I had trouble fitting it. The second page, I had to actually put a, one, one extra line that I normally had. Yeah, there's, there's a lot going on is what it comes down to. Um, that's, yeah, 27, that's a lot. And these, and these are, well, I think, you know, there's, it just took a while. In fact, when you consider that the hurricane came, you know, a couple of hurricanes came to Florida and slowed things down, it's actually still surprising that we got that many. One, one, a couple of things I would take note of here, a lot of those satellites were, were Russian. Um, you really haven't seen many Russian launches in a while, and they have maybe five or six just in this period. Well, they're all, mil they're all military. It is, there, it's, one is I think some of them are just kind of, you know, things they've been wanting to do for a while, and probably they wanted to kind of remind everybody that uh, they're still there. So there's quite a bit of that. Um, we mentioned about the, the Falcon Heavy, the Chinese Space Station. One I'll highlight this, uh, the very last one that happened this morning, or well, at, at, sometime between 11 and 1, it was this launch window. Um, they were launching two Intelsat uh, geosynchronous satellites, that is the ones that are up at 22,000 miles. Um, this went in expendable mode, meaning they're, they're not recovering the boosters. And that's interesting that that's now surprising. I mean, you know, the, the, that's the, so much the norm, but just assume this is going to happen. Uh, what's interesting is I hadn't realized this, but the pricing. If you get official pricing, apparently, from SpaceX, if you want an expendable you know, version of the rocket, which you can squeeze more performance out of as a result, because you don't have to have the extra fuel for landing, um, they charge more. And so Intelsat decided they wanted that. That rocket could actually get thing, things up to a geosynchronous transfer orbit. But what they wanted to do was get it closer to the specific uh, location. Uh, normally, what happens is you throw something up there as, as best you can. and it may not really be the final orbit you want. It may be very eccentric. It may not be quite as high. And so then you use the onboard satellite fuel to get you where you really want to go. And they said, well, no, we want to get up as close as possible to the final orbit. So they did that. And they made that point of saying, yeah, we're going to pay the, we want to pay the extra dollars to get that extra little boost of performance. It's worth it to us. And they paid extra for it. Now, what's interesting from the SpaceX standpoint, that means they can take their oldest, most beat up booster. And they did. Uh, the one, this is the 14th flight of the, the booster that is actually used for that. So it's kind of interesting. It works out well for everybody. The pricing makes sense. It should cost more to pay for an expendable launch. So anyway, that's about it. Um, I just thought I'd show a picture. This is what those two Intelsat satellites look like, stacked, ready to be, actually they were in the process apparently of, put, of integrating it into the payload uh, of that particular um, Falcon 9. Gives you have an idea of the size and everything. Again, usually you see you see the things, a nice artist illustration afterwards, and here you're seeing kind of the real thing in progress.
Okay, so I have a whole lot of material here about Chris, but he has all that in his first slide anyway, so I'll skip over that, except for one thing um, he forgot to put on his slide, is that he is a the newest board member of, of the, the, our chapter of the, the Space Society. <laughs> so so uh, he's going to talk about how to move fast in the solar system. Actually, he's also going to talk about how to move slow in the solar system, like solar sails. And we're just, he's going to cover all of this. So it's, it's up to you. Yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs>